The running back dead zone has been a topic of conversation on this channel for a couple of years now. This year, we really have to dig into this conversation and talk about exactly the dynamics of it, which running back dead zone targets we're actually taking, which running back dead zone targets we are not taking. There is a whole lot outside of the simple old explanation that we used to give, which is rounds four to seven, don't draft running backs because they hit at a lower rate. Now, there's a lot more intricacy. It's going to differ league to league by platform. If you're on underdog, the dead zone behaves completely differently than if you're in an ESPN league with all of your friends and family. So we're excited to talk about this and we're not going to waste any time because we have a lot to get into. So let's start with the running back dead zone hit rates. And as I talked about at the beginning there, the running back dead zone operates way differently than it used to because back 2015, 2016, 2017, you can see the percentage chance of drafting a high win rate running back between picks 36 and 84 of ADP. So around four to seven was about 36, 38, 27%. Last year, that number peaked at 50%. And there's also like less and less running backs going in that range as we go through the years, as opposed to years past. We used to get, you know, the 24th best running back in fantasy going in round five, round six. And now those guys are going well outside of the top six, seven, eight rounds in fantasy football drafts. So the dead zone has behaved completely differently in terms of the profiles you're looking at. Now, running backs nine through 15 and ADP are going between rounds four, rounds five, round six, versus before they were second, third rounders in ESPN sleeper kind of managed home leagues. Yeah, and it was very blocker white back then. At the end of the day, once you were in rounds four to seven, because like you said, those running backs were pushed up the board, you were either taking a dead zone back or avoiding them. Nowadays, it's like, okay, there's a lot more consideration to be made. Are they a true dead zone profile? Or like you said, are they more so a product of the falling ADP of running backs holistically? Because if you go on underdog, even if you go on some of your home league ADPs, like we'll talk about in this video, there are some profiles in this range that quite frankly, if we're talking 2017, 2018, 2019, would be top three round picks. Yeah, not to mention the reason they were dead zone running backs before in like the running back 24-ish range where they were going is you were passing on different profiles of wide receivers than you're passing on now. Like you're passing on the wide receiver 17 in round six versus now it's like the wide receiver 34 is off the board by round six. So that's the difference. And also, you know, the elite tight ends, the elite quarterbacks, things of that nature. So it's not just the dynamic of how running back has been undervalued or devalued in the last two years. It's also that the other positions are pushed up and it's about basically like as easy as it sounds, fantasy football is about drafting the best player. It doesn't matter what position they are. It's that you're drafting the best player. But before the concept of dead zone running backs came up because people were pushing up running backs because they wanted to get them early. And it was better off that you would draft an elite wide receiver, elite tight end, elite quarterback rounds four to seven. But that's not the dynamic that we have at play now. Now people understand that running backs don't need to be pushed up the board. Yeah, like if we're just looking specifically at my rankings right now and kind of contextualizing what the decision point you had to make back then was, Malik Neighbors is currently my wide receiver 19 in fantasy football. If you had to make a decision between a running back and Malik Neighbors in 2018, that running back was more, uh, more, more likely a guy like Aaron Jones, who I have at RB20. Nowadays, that decision is more so, I mean, if we're looking at Malik Neighbors' ADP, is more so a guy like Rashad White or Joe Mixon or James Cook, guys that I have ranked inside of my top 50. And we'll be going through the micro names in this video, talking about whether they're closer to a dead zone profile uh, historically or more so this new age type of bet zone, like you said. Because, I mean, 50% is a stark difference between the sub, you know, 40% we've been seeing in years past. Yeah. And I mean, 2021, it peaked all the way down at like 18%. We only had 11 running backs going in that range. That was like peak me and you talking about not taking dead zone running backs. 2021, 2022 is when that concept became kind of widespread across, not just the degenerate fantasy best ball space, but also trickled in to my home league where people are running zero Might RBs well. like they never used to be doing. And probably a lot of your guys' home leagues listening to this. So we've talked about what's a dead zone running back. What's a bet zone running back. Let's actually define them right now, because when we look at the anatomy of a dead zone running back on the screen right now, you guys can see the lowest win rate running backs from the RB dead zone, that 36 to 84 in ADP from 2020 to 2023. And a lot of these guys suffered injuries, which of course we can't totally predict. 
predict. But a lot of these guys didn't suffer injuries and they were just outright bad and elevated for other reasons. So some of these guys miss for the following kind of reasons here. And this is like the anatomy of a dead zone profile. So we can use these issues and these determining factors to apply to the micro running backs going in the dead zone this year. Talent slash elevated by projected volume. The classic example is Mike Davis. Everybody knows that one. Yeah. Dalvin Cook. Uh, last year, people thought he was going to get va uh, volume early on in the season on FFPC drafts and boomer leagues. They were telling people to draft him round five, round six, because Brees Hall was coming off of a torn ACL. Devin Singletary in his second year was elevated by projected volume. Alexander Madison, also a very good example of this last year. Miles Sanders last year, good example of this. Damian Pierce last year, good example of this. We also have guys that had pre-existing injuries. And as I've talked about with J.K. Dobbins this year, we're not making this mistake anymore. Like anybody coming into the season with a torn ACL or blown Achilles is no longer going in round four, round five, round six, like they used to be going. They're going way later in drafts. So we've cooled down on that. And then a lot of these guys lacked pass catching upside as well. We didn't have a projection of 70 plus targets or 80 plus targets for a lot of these guys going into their season. So that's kind of the anatomy of a dead zone running back. If we have basically talent concerns, receiving upside concerns, maybe injury concerns, some offensive concerns also factor into it, but we're just pushing these guys up because we're like, oh, they're going to get 250 plus touches. That's kind of what a dead zone profile looks like. Yeah, people are more diligent. People are more willing to look at the holistic profile of a lot of these guys nowadays compared to what they were in 2018. Like you kind of said there, if somebody projected for over 250 touches back three, four years ago, even we're talking about two years ago, they were being selected as top five round picks. Obviously, like you said, the biggest example of there would be a guy like Mike Davis. But as we noticed with drafters getting more sharp, with people understanding the concept of opportunity cost and spending a pick at the running back position, knowing how valuable wide receiver depth is. People are looking at now receiving profile, overall volume projection. How good is their offense? How good of a talent that player is a lot more factors rather than like you just said, the raw volume people were looking at even three years ago. Yeah. And like I said before, it also factors in who you're passing on at wide receiver, quarterback and tight end. But for now, we're kind of just focused on the running back profiles themselves. And we can talk about kind of the intricacies of when you want to start deviating for running backs and things of that nature. But the anatomy of a bet zone running back. So this is the opposite side of the coin. The guys that were being drafted in the dead zone that weren't really dead zone profiles. And we should have known that going into the season. And these guys conversely basically hit at a, lot, a much higher win rate, right? You see Josh Jacobs in 2022, Tony Pollard in 2020. To Alvin Kamara last year, Rashad White last year, Travis Etienne last year. The guy's anatomy that you look at with these players is the reason they weren't going higher was projected volume. We were worried about their workloads. We were worried about potentially their offenses and things of that nature. But for the most part, all of these guys on this list were talented players, had pass catching upside, usually were young enough players that maybe they were just a little bit unknown in terms of what kind of workload they were going to see. But fantasy football heuristics would dictate that a second year running back is going to get more uh, volume than he got in his rookie year and things of that nature. And then, I, like I said, bonus points if you were on a great offense, because I mean, 2022, Tony Pollard showed that, you know, uh, Travis Etienne last year when the Jaguars were, you know, humming and hoeing there, they were showing that James Cook last year was showing that um, the ones that did hit that were older. And these ones are a little bit harder to spot, obviously, because they're not young players. We can project forward. We're guys definitely who had pass catching upside Camara, Mixon, Connor all last year had basically good win rate seasons because they were able to catch passes. And then David Johnson, a couple of years ago as well, able to catch passes and get receiving work. If you can project an older running back for volume, and he hasn't really fallen off from a talent standpoint yet, and he's especially going to get receiving volume in a half decent offense, then they're okay picks typically, but they're a lot more bad picks in that range than there are in the young running back, you know, projecting forward with pass catching upside. So again, there's two kind of bet zone profiles we're looking at here. Primarily, we want young running backs with pass catching upside, but also older running backs who haven't fallen off yet with good workloads, potentially in good offenses also could be kind of applicable here. Yeah, like you said, the typical blueprint here is targeting those young running backs that have upside in terms of efficiency, in terms of receiving volume, in terms of overall projectable offense. The only real outliers here, like you said, with the older running backs, mostly have to do with touchdown equity, mostly have to do with overall uses that they got. There are some outliers. Again, Alvin Kamara, we'll talk about him in a second, but he wasn't the most efficient running back this year. But because he got so much damn volume in that team, 86 overall targets, he was able to pay off at his ADP. So we look at some of those profiles every year, understanding the difference. Again, there will be some gray area with some of those older running backs, but if it was a perfect hit rate, everybody would be profitable every single year. 
Yeah, not to mention Kamara was suspended too, and his ADP would have been higher if he wasn't suspended. Yeah. He probably would have been a 40s pick or whatever, and his win rate may be a little bit lower if that's how high you had to draft him. But of course, he still was pretty good last season, so you're probably still a positive win rate regardless. So let's look at our home league ADP, and this is a resource on our draft guide. So if you guys are interested in checking this out, we basically aggregate sleeper, ESPN, underdog, Yahoo, NFL, uh, fantasy ADP and put it all together because I think that gives you the best representation of where these guys are going across the board in sharp leagues in casual leagues, et cetera. And these are the dead zone running backs that fall between that pick 36 and 84 range rounds four through round seven. You see Rashad white, James cook, Joe Mixon, Alvin Kamara, so on and so forth. We're going to go through these guys one by one outline their bull cases, how they hit their bear cases, how they miss, and then kind of give the verdict on whether we think they're a dead zone back or not. So let's start with the first guy in the ADP here, which is Rashad White of my Tampa Bay Buccaneers, basically going right on the fringe of the dead zone in the early fourth round of ADP right now. The bull case is that he was a top 10 running back in PPR points per game last year. He was fourth in weighted opportunities last year, and he had 70 targets from a quarterback who loves targeting his running back. So he fits the young running back with a lot of volume and pass catching upside. So generally speaking, you would say, yeah, he's probably not a dead zone running back just given that that profile. He's definitely a dead zone running back from the talent perspective though, because rush yards over expected yards per carry. Those kind of metrics are not going to like Rashad white. However, is that stuff sticky year over year, especially with the new scheme coming in, especially with the offensive line upgrades that the Buccaneers have made. So that's kind of the bull case is that he's just going to get better as a player because he's young still. And he has a pass catching upside. The bear case is that they drafted Bucky Irving, who has ability to play on all three downs. Rashad white, maybe just isn't good enough to keep that workload. And he ends up becoming this like flash in the pan had one good season and kind of falls out of favor with the team. And the Tampa Bay Buccaneers could take a step back if Baker Mayfield isn't the same level of quarterback that he was last year, basically played like a top 15 quarterback in the NFL. So for me, I look at the verdict of Rashad White, and I would say he is definitely not a dead zone profile, but I'm still not really drafting him at 41 overall. I don't think he's a dead zone profile, but on underdog in sharper leagues, I'll take him there when he's a fifth, sixth, seventh round pick in home leagues where he's going basically at the beginning of the fourth round. He's definitely overvalued, but like I said, I don't think he's a dead zone back. He is definitely a bet zone back. He's just going a little bit too high. Yeah, I think you pretty much outlined the pros and cons of Rashad White, a guy that I would feel more comfortable if he was, like you said, more of a mid to late fifth rounder, early sixth rounder, like he's going on underdog. But at 41 overall, I'm just not pushing the button at that point. Yeah, absolutely. He's just, he's one of those guys that I think is an okay profile. It's just that you need to get him in sharper leagues where people really want to fade the crap out of him. So yeah. I talked about this guy that you're about to talk about here in the league winning running backs video. I moved him all the way up to like a top 36, top 40 player in my overall rankings. Uh, James Cook of the Buffalo Bills. Take it away. Yeah. And the bull case is pretty simple. Young, efficient running back going into his third year after a big time improvement from year one to two. And when you're looking at James Cook, what he was able to do last year, he was very productive as a receiver in 2023. He was number six in the league in yards per route run at the running back position and number five in the league in terms of route percentage amongst running backs with over 40 targets this past season. His usage uptick in the receiving game was expected. Again, he had a receiving profile coming out of college. People pretty much expected him to be this good receiver. But what I'm focused on is just how much stride he made as a runner. The question mark was always 190 pound running back. Can he handle a full three down workload? And he was a guy that down the stretch last year, post Ken Dorsey being fired, was getting a three down workload, 16.7 run rushing attempts per game, over 70 rushing yards per game, including that big monster performance we were able to see live against my beloved Dallas Cowboys. James Cook down the stretch, point blank simply, was an RB1 in fantasy football. And with James Cook, you're also getting him attached to Josh Allen on an offense that was top five in red zone trips in 2023. So pretty good bull case. Good receiver, efficient runner, attached to a Josh Allen offense. The bear case people may have for him is that the touchdown equity in this offense may be a real concern. Obviously, we saw last year, seeded goal line touches to Latavius Murray and to Josh Allen in 2023. And obviously, of course, the team adds a banger between the tackles with Ray Davis in the 2024 NFL draft. You're not expecting James Cook to be a, a big overall touchdown guy. Much better overall depth compared to what they were doing with last year. Those would be the bear cases for why you would be against James Cook. But And my verdict on James Cook is that he is indeed a bet zone running back because 
quite frankly, we know how home league drafters are. They usually prioritize volume. They usually prioritize the safety aspect of the running back position. James Cook is being drafted as a top four round pick with the main concern for him being the overall dominance of touches in this backfield. And anytime that's the case, you're betting on an efficient third year running back in a good projectable offense that could potentially become a 300 touch back. Again, we saw last year him be in the high 200s and that usage really take an uptick down the stretch up to 19 touches per game. If he's able to handle 19 touches per game on a Bills offense that, yeah, maybe they aren't quite as good as they were last year without the presence of Stefan Diggs, but still project to be a top 10 to 12 level offense. I am all the way in on James Cook. Again, ambiguous wide receiver room. Uh, we're putting all this expectation on Dalton Kincaid being this dominant tight end. When in actuality, you could make the case that just as a receiving talent, James Cook may be the best receiving talent they have on that team right now. I think he's their most important offensive weapon. Like, I think yeah. he's the most proven guy. I think he's, uh, like, again, when you think about these bet zone running backs and the reason they were going in the dead zone, it's these bullshit reasons like James Cook has, which is like, oh, is he going to get red zone touches? It's like, what if James Cook takes the next step and apparently he's added weight, according to uh, offensive yeah. coordinator Joe Brady, then there's a good chance that he'll get those red zone opportunities. Do we really expect Josh Allen to have 15 rushing touchdowns again? Like, I don't think that's the case. And Ray Davis right now is operating behind Ty Johnson in training camp right now. Yeah. So it's not like you look at this James Cook situation and think that logically it doesn't make sense that he's just going to take this big step forward as a receiver, as a goal line back, because it all kind of lines up that it logically would make sense he does. Will he need more goal line work objectively than he got last year to absolutely crush? Absolutely. I do feel like he does need more red zone work to be a top three, top five overall running back in fantasy. But even if he were not to get that work, I still think he's a double at his ADP. I still think he could be quite clearly a top 12 to 14 back on the back of his receiving work, on the back of this explosive offense with the Buffalo Bills. So with James Cook, it's almost like you're hitting a single or double if he doesn't get that red zone work. But if he does get that red zone work, man, we talk about the fact that they were top five in red zone trips per game last year with the Buffalo Bills offense. So if we're talking about James Cook potentially getting 15 to 20 inside the 10 carries, his ceiling is immeasurable. Yeah, and again, it can't be understated that he has been very efficient in his career, and he can be making yeah. the most of a 250 to 275 touch workload. And again, there's opportunity for him to get more than that. So let's pivot off of James Cook. He's definitely clearly a bet zone running back yep. and a target for me in the fourth, fifth round of my home league draft. Joe Mixon is the RB15 in ADP right now. The bull case for him is pretty simple. He's been a top 12 running back in three straight years, and pretty much any time he's been healthy in his NFL career. He scored nine-plus touchdowns every year since 2021. We know he can carry a big workload. He's routinely been near the top of the NFL in weighted opportunities per game and opportunity share of his backfield, 64 targets and 74 targets the last two years as well. So he's got a nice receiving floor to help you out. Switches teams this year, which would be a negative, except he goes to an offense that might even be better than the one he left because it's a comparable situation. It's a great young quarterback, three great wide receivers, a good tight end on the outside to draw attention away from Joe Mixon. The red zone opportunities will be there. And by the looks of it, there's a lot of trust in him to be the workhorse. Anytime they get behind a microphone, they keep saying he's going to be a workhorse running back and he's going to carry the load for us. So I tend to believe them. I think Joe Mixon's done that the whole time he's been in the NFL, and he's probably going to do that in Houston as well. The bear case on Joe Mixon is that he's 28 years old and he has over 1,900 career touches and he's been inefficient and combining the team switch that kind of presents risk. However, like I said, he is in a, a position where he can be inefficient and kind of be good anyways. And it's a bad offensive line. And like, you can paint the picture that Joe Mixon sucks this year. I think the only way that he fails is if he gets hurt or if Damian Pierce just looks like his rookie season form and he kind of works into the backfield. Those are the only two ways that Joe Mixon fails this year. So for me, he's a bet, a bet zone running back. And I've almost never been in on Joe Mixon at his price tag, but he checks a lot of the green flags. Again, the older running back, like, I mean, he was literally just one last year. If you're going to be an older running back, you need workload. You need ability to score touchdowns. You need ability to catch passes. And if Mixon fails, like I said, it will be because he's utterly and completely washed or he just gets injured. And I don't think that either of those things are likely to happen. He's definitely not the same player he was in 2018, but I don't think he's utterly washed. And I don't think Damian Pierce, as much as I like Damian Pierce is like a late round dart throw is going to suddenly look like his rookie season self. I think the fit in the offense is something that is probably never, we're never going to see rookie season Damian Pierce again, potentially. Yeah. The funny thing with Joe Mixon is that what's, uh, despite changing teams this off season, What's all too dissimilar about his situation this year than it was 2023 with the Cincinnati Bengals? Other than the fact that 
we're expecting full 17 game health for CJ Stroud. Whereas going into the season last year, Joe Burrow was dealing with that calf injury. Again, the Texans offense, we expect to be one of the top five to eight units in the NFL. Joe Mixon has shown the ability to handle on all three downs. Again, in his last two years, 75, 64 targets, checking that box. The only box he doesn't check, and it's a subjective box, is that is the workload going to catch up to him? Is he a talented running back at this point in his career? The only question marks we have are of Joe Mixon his, himself because, again, the workload's going to be there. The receiving's going to be there. The offensive insulation is going to be there that as long as he plays 17 games, he can almost fall ass backwards into a top 12 finish. Yeah, and not to mention Zach Taylor's rushing offense versus uh, Bobby, Slowick. Bobby Slowick. Like, I mean, he, he didn't call a great rushing offense last year, but Devin Singletary was his lead back. He, it's a better scheme, objectively. Like all these 49ers based schemes are better and going to elevate the talent of the running back in it. Yep. So Joe Mixon could be exactly as good as he was last year and probably bump his yards per carry up by 0.5. Yeah, no, I agree with you on Joe Mixon. I think he is also a bet zone running back, which is weird. We're in on Joe Mixon. Of course, this is going to be the year that he just falls off a cliff, but that's the risk you got to take sometimes because you're not dealing with the certainty of the bets that you are in the top two rounds. Speaking of certainty of the bets in the top two rounds, this is a guy that was a staple of fantasy football in his first four years. Heck, if you guys had him on that Christmas game a few years ago, you probably won your fantasy championship. And we're talking about Alvin Kamara going off the board as the RB16. The bull case for Alvin Kamara is that last year in only 13 games played, he saw 266 opportunities and 86 targets in 2023. Finished as the RB11, but like I said, because he missed a few games, he his points per game was actually higher than his overall finish. Finished RB11 was the RB3 in PPR points per game. You could also point to the fact that with new offensive scheme changes with Clint Kubiak coming in, should be beneficial for the offense as a whole. He is a clear upgrade coming from that San Francisco scheme you mentioned with Bobby Slowick instead of what they had with Pete Carmichael this past season. And of course, the bull case as well is that there's a lot of uncertainty with the running backs behind him on the depth chart right now. I mean, Dennis Allen went on record to criticize Kendra Miller not being able to stay healthy. Jamal Williams was completely inefficient in his first year in New Orleans. A lot of question marks, a lot of uncertainty with the situation there with the Saints. However, the bear case for Alvin Kamara, 29-year-old running back that showed significant signs of decline in his last three years. I mean, last year was his worst year as an NFL professional. 3.86 yards per carry, 5.42 yards per target. Second worst in terms of his career yards per carry. Worst in terms of his career yards per target. He also saw some red zone usage being sniped quite a bit by a guy like Taysom Hill. He only had a 40% share of the inside the five carries for the New Orleans Saints in 2023. And while Dennis Allen isn't impressed by the running backs behind him quite yet, there is still a lot of offseason to go. We're still yet to enter the preseason. Who knows? Maybe Kendrick gets healthy. Maybe he shows some more signs. Maybe that touch split ends up being closer when the season starts than kind of what we view it as now. And the final bear case that I have on them is that entering year eight, this is usually the year we start to see a stark decline of running backs. Between year seven and year eight is the biggest drop-off comparatively. Like you guys can see on the screen, year seven to eight, we see a drop-off from a 97.2% of a career average production in year seven to only a 73.1% career average in year eight. So with Alvin Kamara, the data points to him entering year eight, him showing the signs of efficiency drop-off that we can't really expect what he did in 2023 to continue. So for me, I think he's a dead zone running back. He is literally the definition of a dead zone running back to a T, in my opinion. I think his projection is extremely strong. Again, I went through all the pros of what he was able to accomplish last year, but betting on a guy that showed that significant of a drop-off in an unideal situation with the New Orleans Saints is something that makes me queasy, especially when I have to do it in round five. If I'm an underdog and I'm getting him closer to you know the 65, the 70, the 75 pick ADP, I'm more willing to push the button on Alvin Kamara's draft card, but once you have to do it as high as you do in home leagues, I'm staying away and I'm drafting the young wide receivers because there's way too much risk here. Yeah. So the only thing I disagree with is that I don't actually think he's the definition of a dead zone running back, but That's I think the concerns and like the balance of the risk is totally fair. And I have the exact same opinion, which is that I'm never touching him yeah. in a home league and I would probably still be fine drafting him seven, six, eight percent of the of my exposure in my portfolio on underdog because I do think he has some upside. And I mean, if you play underdog or if you play like PPR formats too, like he's obviously going to be more valuable because he's going to catch passes and things of that nature. But yeah, I don't think he's necessarily a dead zone running back because like I said, the guys that hit um, who are older running backs are usually pass catching upside guys with good workloads, which is precisely what Alvin Kamara is, especially like, I think, I don't think you yeah. stated how bad the rest of the running backs in the backfields situations and outlooks it's bad are right now. 
it's bad right like, now. It's very for sure. clear to me that Dennis Allen, Clint Kubiak are just going to feed Kamara, whether he's efficient or not. And I would say in the early portion of the year, I'd probably agree. Like, we'll make reference to with a couple of the other running backs in this range. It's just if Alvin Kamara shows the same level of efficiency as he did last year, what do they have to lose with giving potentially more work to the second year running back? I understand he's been battling injuries, but who knows? Maybe in the preseason, Kendra Miller shows some more signs, is able to chip into this workload as the season goes along. Again, early season. I think he's an RB2 projection, but just the risk factor of the offense, just the risk factor of a potential young running back usurping him, I have a little bit more concerns when it comes to taking him in the top five rounds. Yeah, he's he's precisely the type of back that I'm going to have in my week four sell highs in yeah. the regular season where he's like maybe RB6 in points per game because he's caught, you know, 14 passes in three games, but he like just totally looks washed or whatever, like He's the type of dude that I think is going to be a sell high during the regular season. And it's like, again, in best ball, it's like if you need the early season production, it makes sense. But in a home league, I think he's going to go a little bit higher than I'm willing to pick him. Yeah. And the last underrated factor that I can bring up to his bear case that uh, I didn't I didn't outline, but is very significant is that Ryan Ramchick expected not to play in the NFL season this year. You can make the case that the Saints may just have the worst offensive line in the league at this point. Yeah, I believe the um, the O line rankings for PFF they did them a couple months ago, and the New Orleans Saints are in fact thirty second on that list. Yeah. So, so uh, not not a great <laughs> situation. Not a great situation there. And speaking of bad O lines, let's get to Kenneth Walker and the Seattle Seahawks here. Yeah. Bull case for Kenneth Walker again because we're trying to do bull and bear case for each one of these guys, even yeah. if we don't like them. And we very staunchly have not been Kenneth Walker guys. The Seahawks are a great team potentially this year with offensive coordinator Ryan Grubb. So that is probably how Kenneth Walker pays off the explosive passing game, downfield passing, play action, all that kind of stuff. It results in Kenneth Walker having inflated rushing efficiency numbers. Their offensive line maybe plays better than what I think 28th is where they're ranked right now or 27th on uh, PFF's O-line rankings. And Kenneth Walker, we know, has the ability to create big plays and he can score in the red zone. That's something he's done at a pretty high clip so far in his career. The bear case for Kenneth Walker and the th side that me and you kind of side on yeah. is that Zach Charbonnet is both a better pass catcher than him and better consistency wise in short yardage in between the tackles. Kenneth Walker, this boomer bust runner that most coaching staffs aren't really super in love with. There's no allegiance to him as the lead guy. It's an all new coaching staff that came in. It's not Pete Carroll anymore. It's not any guys that drafted Kenneth Walker um, as far as the coaching is concerned. So for me, he's the prototypical dead zone running back because the prototypical dead zone running backs lack pass catching upside and typically don't have high ceilings. And that's exactly what Kenneth Walker represents here, where if you miss, if I miss on Kenneth Walker and he's, he proves me wrong. What is he? RB 14 in points per game, like RB 15 in points per game. Like Maybe. he's not going to be RB six in points per game. If I miss on Kenneth Walker, he's a small win, big miss. That's basically what Kenneth Walker is. So even though he's young and he's talented in certain areas of playing running back, he's not a complete three down guy. There's major workload concerns in this ambiguous backfield and his backfield mate might be legitimately better than him and also a better fit for this offense. Cause they're talking about throwing to the running back position more. So for me, prototype dead zone running back with Kenneth Walker. Yeah, like, can you say with a straight face that Kenneth Walker is all that better than Zach Charbonnet? Because, I mean, we're on the same agreement that Zach Charbonnet may just be flat out the better running back. Entering year two, we saw last year him chip into the workload. What if this is just a straight 50-50 committee on a team that likes to throw the ball in the red zone? Yeah, like, I, I'm not saying that Charbonnet is like this must-draft player that he's way no. better than Kenneth Walker, but he has more contingent upside for a Walker injury than Walker has if Charbonnet goes down because we know that they're going to use a pass catching back if Char uh, if Charbonnet gets injured. And also too, because he's a, a year one to year two projection, we could see him get a lot better because that typically happens with year one to year two projections at the running back position. So for me, Kenneth Walker is just a guy that I'm not drafting. In underdog drafts and in home league drafts, he just goes higher than I'm willing to pick him. I wouldn't pick him until outside the dead zone and he's never falling outside of it. Yeah, I think you pretty much outlined the exact case for what I believe with Kenneth Walker as well. We can go on to RB18, and that is going to be David Montgomery, running back of the Detroit Lions. I believe is, this is what the first running back we talked about that isn't even the hot, highest selected running back on his own team. Yes, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I mean, that kind of uh, <laughs> goes to show where I'm going to end up leaning. But let me just make the bull case for David Montgomery because, I mean, he was good in 2023. I'm not going to take that away from him. He's attached to an elite offense, which he just scored 13 touchdowns for 
this past season. He finished as the RB17, RB15 in PPR points per game. So when you're doing the math, he's going as RB18, was the RB17 last year, 15 points per game. Seems like a reasonable ADP based off what he was able to do in 2023. Great offensive line play, great sequencing there with Ben Johnson. And he had the full autonomy of the goal line role in 2023. He was top four and inside the five carries with 17. He was fifth and inside the 10 carries with 31. And the implied value should Gibbs miss time is massive. We're talking about if Gibbs were to miss any time this year, David Montgomery is probably a top 12 running back in our ranking. So that's the bull cases. The bear case is that Jameer Gibbs is currently being selected as, as a top 15 overall fantasy pick in the exact same backfield in that once Jameer Gibbs returned from injury in 2023, so the splits week 10 on when both of them shared the field together, David Montgomery saw a significant decline in his overall workload. We saw in the time that they played together prior to the injury, David Montgomery was a running back that was averaging 18.8 carries per game and 1.2 touchdowns per game. Those totals dropped to 13.89 uh, carries and 0.78 rushing touchdowns per game once Jameer Gibbs came back week 10 on. He went from a guy that was averaging over 17 PPR points per game and RB1 in that stretch before he got hurt to 13.57, still a fine number, but kind of paints the picture for what exactly you're dealing with. If Jameer Gibbs is healthy and why I believe David Montgomery is a dead zone running back is that he has a very unlikely path to smashing his ADP. His only real path to doing so is Jameer Gibbs missing eight plus games this upcoming season. And with David Montgomery, you're basically betting on him, you know, hitting a single, uh, single finishing with the exact same goal line role he did last year, being a mid-range running back too. But you guys would have noticed that year two is usually the peak year for a running back in their career. Guess what? Jameer Gibbs is entering his second year as a top 12 overall draft capital running back who, quite frankly, ate into some of that goal line role once he came back week 10 on. So with David Montgomery, he feels like a low-end running back two projection that you're taking as a mid-range running back two because he scored 13 touchdowns last year. If you were to take his exact same stat line from last year and instead write nine touchdowns instead of 13, you have a very different proposition in your hands. Yeah, it totally reminds me of Mark Ingram in 2017, Alvin Kamara's yep. rookie he was RB8 in points per game. The following season, Alvin Kamara takes a large step in his overall volume and his overall workload, and he was RB26 in points per game. And I know he was suspended, but I'm saying points per game-wise, he was RB26. If David Montgomery finishes RB26, you're going to be disappointed with that draft selection yep. because he could also still get injured because he's an older running back with a lot of uh, touches, touches under his belt and things of that nature. So yeah, also, David Montgomery, very classic example of drafting the previous year's production as opposed yep. to projecting what happens this year because year one to year two Jameer Gibbs is going to get more work this year it's just going to happen yeah I mean historically the hit rates between year one and two we see that a running back in their first year averages about 86 percent of their career average production that skyrockets to over 120 percent by the math we can basically expect Jameer Gibbs to be 1.5x the player that he was last year pretty much yeah, and he was like, what, RB8 in points per game last year? Like, he's going to have more work than he had last year and probably finish as a top five running back, no doubt about it. So let's move into Aaron Jones, who also is very similar to, like, Mixon and Kamara, where I'm like, you could paint a rosy picture for this guy. Like, you look at the bull case for Aaron Jones, and he has not fallen off when he's healthy. When he's on the field, he's still a really good player. Very he's top efficient. 15 in yards created per touch last year. EPA per play, he was top 15. Yards per touch, he was top 15 even though he was banged up all year. So you could say like, oh, his numbers dropped off because he was injured. It's like, no, when he was healthy, he was still very good. He goes to an offense with no real proven running back talent. As much as I like taking swings on Ty Chandler late on in drafts, it's like he's not really going to do anything to push Aaron Jones, in my opinion. Like Aaron Jones is clearly the better running back at this point in time. And a lot of people said like, why would they sign Josh Jacobs in Green Bay when they could have just kept Aaron Jones? Kevin O'Connell runs a good scheme, and that's a bull case for Aaron Jones, right? We know he's a good yep. play caller. We know they're going to be probably overperforming relative to the quarterback play that they have just because of the coaching and the weapons around um, the pass catchers there. And the Vikings offensive line is a top 10 unit in run blocking grades. So you look at Aaron Jones, 4.8 yards per carry last year. Like I said, 85.7 PFF rushing grade. That's in line with how good he's been over the course of his entire career. The bear case for Aaron Jones is that if I had to put like Vegas odds on one of these running backs to get injured, I would probably put Aaron Jones as the absolute favorite in this video. He'll turn There's 30 one. this season. 
There's What's one up? that I would there's one that would argue uh, that I would argue has a higher risk. I'll get into him in a couple spots. Yeah, there is actually. Yeah, you're right. There is one that's a higher risk. He'll turn 30 this season, over 1500 career touches, and he's switching teams from an offense that had Aaron Rodgers and Jordan Love to one with Sam Darnold and JJ McCarthy. And even though, you know, Kevin O'Connell's a great play sequencer and a great play caller, Matt LaFleur is even better, especially as a run play caller. Like he's a very good play caller in terms of the run game and using Aaron Jones properly. So this offense needs to be a lot better than we're expecting it to be for Aaron Jones to really crush his ADP. And more importantly, Aaron Jones has to stay healthy and has to still be the same guy that he was. So I think he's a dead zone running back, but I'm not confident in that stance because I could see Aaron Jones burning me. Aaron Jones mid round five, where he's going right now, that's a bit rich for me. If he's on the board round seven, round eight, just like Alvin Kamara in, in underdog drafts and sharper leagues, I am willing to take my shares at that point in time. He checks more boxes than he doesn't. He has talent. He has pass catching upside, a good workload projection. If he was still on Green Bay, he'd probably have two rounds higher of an ADP than he has right now. I look at Aaron Jones and I'm like, I, I, he's a dead zone running back, but I recognize he could be a top 10 dude and make me look stupid for that. It's just that I don't trust the quarterback turmoil. And I think that he has a high chance of getting injured and falling off. Yeah. I, you outlined it perfectly as well. How is how I view it with a guy like Aaron Jones? I currently have him ranked as my RB 20. So if we're looking at my overalls, yeah, you mentioned mid round five is a little bit steep for my blood as well. Once you get into the, you know, 78 overall, 82 overall, 85 overall type of range in your draft. So what is that? Like seventh round? That's when I'd yeah. be willing to take him. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, he's just going a little bit too high. Him, Alvin Kamara and Rashad White are all running backs that I think are like fringe dead zone, bet zone kind of guys that are just simply going higher than I'm willing to take them. I don't think they're necessarily bad bets. I just prefer wide receivers, quarterbacks and tight ends in that range. Yeah, and uh, the same case goes for my uh, the RB20 overall in ADP with James Conner. Bull case is that he quietly had the best season of his career in 2023. Highest PFF rushing grade, highest PFF offensive grade, highest yards after contact per attempt in his career, 60 missed tackles, fours, 31 10 plus yard rushers. Like you think of James Conner as like, oh, this slow, old, plodding running back, but. He was actually really damn efficient last year. And with Kyler Healthy, the offense, of course, has a much stronger projection than it did last season. He handled a dominant share of their red zone and goal line work. And the coaching staff has reaffirmed all offseason that he is their number one running back, even ahead of Trey Benson. However, my bear case, they did draft Trey Benson in the third round. We both believed he was a clear-cut top two running back in the 2024 NFL draft and that He's adding a significant talent to compete for touches with. Again, I fully expect in the early portion of the year, James Conner should be a 65%, possibly 70% opportunity share guy. But like I said with Alvin Kamara, like I said with some of these older running backs, when you have a young, a talented running back breathing down your neck, we could see that workload possibly even up if not favor Trey Benson as the season goes along. The other factor is the Cardinals were second worst in pass rate over expectation in 2023. As you guys can see, the only team that had a lower pass rate over expectation was the Atlanta Falcons who everybody pointed out, why are they just running the ball in this situation? Why are they throwing the ball 20 times per game? Give Derek London his targets. Give Kyle Pitts his targets. Everybody had their own opinion on how Arthur Smith was operating the Falcons last year. And the next closest team to them was the Arizona Cardinals. So again, I expect going into 2024 with Kyler Murray fully healthy, with fourth overall pick Marvin Harrison Jr. added to this team, they'll be a lot closer to that least middle of the pack than they are second in lowest pass rate over expectation. And the final thing is that Connor has not played a full season in his NFL career. He now enters year eight, which like I outlined for Alvin Kamara is typically the drop off year in production for running back. So for me personally, verdict dead zone or bet zone, he is a dead zone running back. Again, if I can get him closer to his 84th overall ADP on underdog, I'm cool with it because I really do feel like in the early season of his production, we could be looking at an RB2 on a mid-range level offense in the NFL, but there's just so many warts on his profile to warn him being a pick in the early sixth round. Very similar case, like I said, with David Montgomery. David Montgomery have the offensive insulation advantage, James Conner having the touch advantage. Again, early season, I'm fine with having James Conner, but I do not want to be left holding the bag with this guy once Trey Benson starts usurping him in the depth chart, whether that's week six, week seven, week eight. History will provide the fact that James Conner should be worse than he was last year, and Trey Benson is the type of running back talent that will capitalize on that. Yeah, it's 
he's not that bad of a projection if you're getting him in round eight but he exactly. is a bad projection in round six because in round six, I'm probably passing on like Pitts or Kittle at tight end. I'm probably passing on maybe Anthony Richardson, but even his own teammate, Kyler Murray. Xavier worthy. You know, yeah. Like at quarterback, you're passing on good options at wide receiver. I mean, you're passing on all the upside, you know, Xavier worthy, Jackson Smith and Jigba, Lad McConkey type of dudes and hell, even potentially guys that are better than that, like yeah. Christian Kirk or, guys like that going in the um, round six portion of home league drafts. For me, James Conner is is definitely a dead zone running back because he, he gave us so much hope last year by playing at a high level. But they also, like you said, they were running simply to get out of games because they were like not a good team and they just wanted the season to be over with so they could spend their draft picks. And this year, they're going to be a lot more competitive and they invested in wide receiver, I think. Again, if the offense is good, that's good for James Conner. I just think Trey Benson is really good. And even though they have made really no indication that Trey Benson's going to be a major part of the backfield yet, he'll get there. He's a good player. He'll eventually eat into the workload. Maybe it's week four, maybe it's week seven, maybe it's week 10. And like you said, Connor could still get hurt as well. And the other factors, like he was really damn good in 2023. But if you looked at the graphic I just shared, that is just such an outlier season compared to the rest of his career. We're talking about a guy that never crossed over an 80, 80 PFF rush or offensive grade. Actually, one time he crossed over 81.9 in his offensive grade. Last year was just so far ahead of his career average to the point that do we think he's just going to become this automatically way better player going from year seven, week uh, year eight versus the guy that we saw in his first six years? Yeah, it just it seems like bait. It seems like getting us like, he's the type of dude that like the year eight age cliff totally hits him like a ton of bricks. Like it hit Jamal Williams last year, or like it yeah. hit um, one of those guys where you're just like, Oh, he was actually good the year previous. If you look at the advanced metrics and then he just like looks completely washed the next year. Like it, it wouldn't shock me if we see that with James Connor at all as well. So let's move into the next guy. We have Ramondre Stevenson here, RB 21 in ADP. The bull case is that, I mean, he was going round three in fantasy last year with worst quarterback play. Jacoby Brissett, when he was last the starter to begin the season, was the 12th highest graded quarterback in PFF passing grade when he was the Browns starter in 2022. So even if Jacoby Brissett starts six, seven, eight, ten 10 games this year, I feel comfortable saying that he's better than Mac Jones and Bailey Zappi. Second, we have the upside that Drake May, a quarterback prospect we both thought was very comparable to Caleb Williams, who went first overall, is going to be ready to start games pretty soon as well, and he could elevate the offense. I like the receiving additions they made. Jalen Polk, Javon Baker, Pop Douglas in year two, all those type, uh, type of guys. Ramondre Stevenson has been a talented running back in the past, finished RB10 in points per game in his second season in 2022 when he averaged over five yards per carry and he caught 69 passes. And even though he only scored six touchdowns, he finished RB10 in points per game. Had he scored 12 touchdowns that year, he would have been a top six running back and one of the biggest league winners in fantasy as a guy who was going outside of the RB dead zone in 2022 that you got RB1 pretty much production out of. The big contract to me indicates that he'll see a big workload. They didn't have to pay him, but they did pay him a pretty decent contract this year. So that's the bull case. And I tend to lean towards the bull case with Ramondre Stevenson. But the bear case is that the offense is in flux. You got quarterback turmoil with Brissett to Drake May. They take a while to gel on offense in general with all those new wide receivers. Ramondre maybe isn't as good as I think he is. Maybe he's just a flash in the pan type of talent. Never gets back to that 2022 form. The offensive line is very questionable. They're like a bottom five offensive line by PFF entering the year. And Antonio Gibson, I don't think he's very good at this point in his career. But if nothing else, he could steal receiving upside from Ramondre Stevenson, and that's maybe something that caps his overall ceiling. So for me, he's a bet zone running back. He's a guy that I'm bullish on, on the side of the Pats projection where they take a step forward this year, and they're not dead last in the NFL, like they're being projected as an offense. At cost, it's worthwhile to stab at a guy who you can get round seven, round eight, who could give you 15 PPR points per game. In round three, that's a bad ceiling. You don't want 15 points per game as the ceiling in round three. But in round seven, round eight, after you already have a loaded wide receiver core because you took five of them already, you already have a Trey McBride tight end or something because you took him in the early rounds, and maybe you already have a quarterback and a hero RB in addition to that. Yeah, I'm okay taking Ramondre Stevenson as my RB2, my seventh or eighth selected player. Yeah, and I, I understand why people would be pessimistic because he came out of the gates really struggling. Again, he I, I believe there was a stretch, what, the first five weeks of the year where he didn't have a single game over 3.5 yards per carry. I honestly he think really he bad to start the year last year. I, I honestly think he entered the year banged up because that's the only real explanation for how inefficient he was, especially when you compare that to the fact that this was a guy that 
was averaging over 4.5 yards per carry in both of his first two years in the NFL. So I tend to think he was battling through something, whether it was a lower body injury, whatever the case may be, maybe something that wasn't disclosed. We did see from week six to 12, once he started getting his efficiency back, again, a guy in those first five weeks didn't eclipse over 3.33 yards per carry. From week six to 12, we did see that type of 2022 Ramondre Stevenson come back. 4.6 yards per carry, 3.78, 3.9, 9.67, 4.4, 4.67. 4 and even the game he left against the Chargers where he ended up missing the rest of the season, 4.33 yards per carry. So once he was able to get back to his normal efficiency levels, we saw 2022 production return. 18 PPR points, 14.5 PPR points, 7 PPR points, 24.9 PPR points, 13.2 PPR points, and 21.7 PPR points between week 6 and 12. So again, a lot of uh, a lot of numbers thrown at you guys, but the point remains that the same efficient 2022 from Andre Stevenson, I think is still that guy that we get, assuming he is healthy entering the season. Yeah, and again, it's hard to click the button on him. So I would make sure that if you do draft from Andre Stevenson round seven, round eight, I would like to have a hero running back already. And also, yeah. I would like the rest of my team to be attached to good offenses that I really believe in. Because I look when I look at my team, just as a general strategy, like through round six, round seven, round eight, I only like one deviation into a bad offense. The rest of my players I want on offenses that I believe in. And Ramondre Stevenson strikes me as the type of guy that if I'm going to make a deviation for a bad offense, a guy with a big workload, an offense that could be better than I'm thinking they're going to be too, he's the type of guy that I'd be willing to go after as like my RB2 in a, in a fragile running back build. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we'll go on to the RB22 and ADP. And that's going to be Zamir White of the Las Vegas Raiders. The bull case for Zamir White, and again, you, if you guys have watched the channel, you kind of know where we're at with Zamir White. But, of course, like Corey said, we got to make the bull and bear case for every one of these players. With Zamir White, the bull case is that he came on strong at the late portion of last year. We saw, once he was able to get a workload in the last four weeks of the year, over 15 PPR points per game, 21 rushing attempts, nearly 100 rushing yards per game. So, clearly showed that as a rusher specifically, he was able to come on in those last four games. He has talked extremely highly of him. I mean, we've seen, you know, workout picks with his muscles bulging. Obviously, Antonio Pierce is ta talking about him being this hoss of a running back, a guy they want to feed the ball to. And, of course, another pro going for him is that, unlike some of the other running backs on this list, he is still young, 24 years old, entering year three of his NFL career. He does have good size at 215 pounds, does have good speed with 4'4 speed. The bear case for him is that the offense projects as one of the worst in the entire NFL. The upside, uh, the touchdown upside in this offense is extremely lacking. I think in the video you did yesterday when we're recording this, you had the Raiders as your worst rated offense. Is that correct? Yeah, they were 32. Right. Uh, not a strong receiving running back. We even saw last year in his, you know, peak stretch down the stretch. He wasn't a guy that was doing it all that much in the receiving game. 3.25 uh, targets in that stretch, 15 receiving yards. Solid. It's not a non-zero, but also at the same time, it's not something that you're going to write home about as a big time value addition across the year. And the other question I have quite simply is that although he showed to be competent in those four games, I didn't think he was a very good prospect. I still have question marks about how, just how good of a runner he is. If he's just even an average NFL runner on a bad offense with no receiving volume, what exactly is the upside for Zamir White? So for me, I view him as a dead zone running back because there's so many factors going against him than there are going for him. Again, I think he's in an interesting profile because typically I wouldn't classify a 24-year-old running back who produced down the stretch like he did as a dead zone running back, but he really feels like the most similar case to what we were drafting Alexander Madison for last year. You know, funny enough, he's now a teammate with Zamir White. He is the backup running back for the Raiders, but with Alexander Madison, the case for him last year, 25-year-old running back, showed some life in small samples, filling in for Dalvin Cook, and the community was so quick to assume he would be the solid running back to production that got this big-time workload. Zamir White is kind of the exact same case this year, only I would argue that the Minnesota Vikings in 2023 projected as a much better offense than what we have for the 2024 Las Vegas Raiders. So for me, I very much expect Zamir White to get the lion's share of the work early on. I would not be shocked if, as the season goes along, this becomes a much closer committee between whether it's him and Alex or Madison, whether they sign a running back, whether, you know, uh, a running back comes out of the workload in the preseason, who knows? But what it comes down to is that with Samir White, I just simply don't think he's a talented enough running back to command 20 rushing attempts per game across a full 17 game season. 
Yeah, I guess one other bull case thing that I would put in his favor is yep. that he had 12 red zone touches over the stretch that he was the starting running back for the Raiders, and he only scored yep. one touchdown during that time. So we, we don't think it's going to be a good offense, but if you're getting 20 <clears throat> carries a game, like you're pretty much every other game, you're going to score a touchdown, just given how yep. much they want to run the ball in the red zone and given how much they're giving him in terms of overall volume. Like you said, maybe Dylan Lowby, you know, cracks into the receiving workload, yep. Alexander Madison, whatever. I, I don't, I just don't love drafting Zamir white because I think his upside is limited, but at the same time, like, you know, he's a young running back. He's got breakaway speed. It's like, if, what if we squint in this offense is like as good as the Colts were last year with Gardner Minshew or with, um, Zach with Moss is not a bad comparison. <laughs> no, it's really not. And if they're <laughs> as good as the Colts were last year, they're going to be a lot better than we're thinking. Cause that's not the 32nd best offense in the league. It's like the 21st or 22nd best offense in the league. So again, Zamir white is one of those guys where I also kind of view him as like small win, big loss. Like he, he could be RB 16 in points per game and it wouldn't shock me, but I also could see him being RB 39 in points per game. Yeah, I know exactly. Where is his ADP right now? If we're looking, he's going off the board round six in home league ADP. I'm much more aligned with where he goes on underdog. I have him ranked as a fringe, you know, top 90, top 95. Totally fine running. pick on underdog, in my opinion. You can run yeah. a straight zero RB and get him as like your RB1 workload guy early in the season um, after drafting four, five, six wide receivers and elite onesie at each position on underdog. It makes a lot more sense on there than it does in home league ADP because people in home leagues are going to be very quick to say that he's got a huge workload coming and he's going to be, you know, pushed up the board. Yeah. He's currently my 91st ranked player. So again, underdog a lot closer to that range round six. I can't do it. Yeah. Like I have him actually a little bit higher than you. I've met 87, but I'm still not quite in line with where home league ADPs have them there. So let's get into Deandre Swift, who is a guy that we actually have a little bit of disagreement on um, RB 23 right now in ADP. The bull case is that the Bears offense, I think, could really be the breakout unit of 2024. Caleb Williams is that good. Um, that's Agreed. mainly the reason for it. And also, you don't have Jalen Hurts there to snipe him on the goal line. He has a good offensive line. So DeAndre Swift, I mean, returned a 10.1% win rate in best ball last year uh, when everybody was ready to write him off. And he still produced out as pretty much an RB1 until the Eagles collapsed down the stretch of the season. He was RB8 points per game over that stretch. And from week two, to that stretch because in week one, they did that weird thing where they gave Kenneth Gainwell the full workload. DeAndre Swift was actually RB six in points per game during that stretch. He has receiving upside. He commanded 49 targets last year on just 36% of his team's routes with a mobile quarterback. And prior to that 70 targets in two straight seasons. So DeAndre Swift going to a situation from a target standpoint, it's more favorable than the one he was with in Philly where Jalen Hurts is not going to check down very often. And also they were sharing uh, re uh, receiving reps there with Kenneth Gainwell and some of the other running backs. They paid him to be the lead running back in free agency. First day of free agency, he was signed by them to good money. Even his career worst season last year in terms of PPR points per game at 12.5, he still finishes RB 24 in points per game, which is about where he's being drafted right now. And every season other than last year, he was RB 15 in points per game in Detroit in 2022, RB eight in points per game in 2021, RB 15 in points per game, his rookie season. So again, he has upside. He has the ability to outperform this ADP. The bear case, which I'm sure you're going to point to, is yeah. where he fails is the workload, particularly in the red zone. But in general, how many routes is he going to run? Because Roshan Johnson is a capable pass catcher. How much rushing work is he going to relinquish to Khalil Herbert, who's very good last year? He was top 15 running back in PFF rushing grades. So you look at Khalil Herbert, capable running back. You look at Roshan Johnson, capable third down back. In my opinion, if I was the Bears, I would have just rolled with Khalil Herbert and uh, Roshan Johnson, but they didn't. They went out and paid DeAndre Swift. They thought it was a good, worthwhile investment for their soon-to-be young quarterback. Early round six is too early for me in his home league ADP, but he is a bet zone running back for me. I am not opposed to him in round seven, round eight. In sharper leagues, I think he'll go a lot round later than people spot. are thinking. Exactly. The upside is a top 15 running back, basically like he's been throughout the entire throughout the entire portion of his career. At non-top 15 price tags, I'm okay taking the swing on DeAndre Swift because, like I said, I believe in the Chicago Bears. I believe in this offense. Definitely not a guy that's going to finish RB5 in points per game, but round seven, round eight, if you're getting a high-end RB2, you should probably feel pretty confident that you're getting a good value. Similar to Ramondre Stevenson, you fill out your wide receiver core, fill out your quarterback, fill out your tight end position, and he's your hero R RB for a zero, or he's um, you know, your RB2 in a hero RB type of build. Yeah, he's currently ranked as my RB21 right now, so I'd have him more so on the lower end of the RB2 projection. Again, not to say that I don't mind DeAndre Swift specifically where he's going on underdog. 
it's more so just I have a little bit more uncertainty with the situation here. Again, you did mention the presence of Khalil Herbert. Khalil Herbert graded better, more efficient as a running back last year than DeAndre Swift did. I will agree with you the fact that because he got paid this offseason, DeAndre Swift should get the first crack. But I do think there is some risk that if DeAndre Swift maybe struggles out of the gate, new offense, obviously working with Shane Waldron, maybe Khalil Herbert shows more efficiency that this becomes more of a closer split than people want to admit. On top of that, he has to get there in the receiving game because quite frankly, as a rusher, especially once you get inside the 20, inside the 10, inside the 5, DeAndre Swift has really struggled in this aspect of being a running back since his rookie season. So his rookie season was good in this aspect. Since his rookie season, years two on, he's been a guy that just simply has not graded well inside the 10-yard line specifically. Last year, despite being on the Philadelphia Eagles, third most red zone trips, people will argue to the fact that he was you know, sniped by Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts, obviously, big-time usage in those areas. DeAndre Swift was still top 10 in the NFL in terms of overall inside the 10 rushes. 27 of them he was only able to score on 18.52 percent of his inside the 10 carries and only 20 percent of his inside the five carries the only running back who was top 10 in volume who graded worse in terms of the efficiency of being able to punch in volume to touchdowns was actually of my beloved dallas cowboys last year with tony pollard who i can tell you firsthand man watching a running back get handed the ball three times in the row and be able to muster two rushing yards and not punch it in and then just seeing a guy like again people will point to jalen hurts in the tush push DeAndre Swift multiple times getting the carries inside the five-yard line left it short, left it on the two-yard line, left it on the one-yard line. And you can make the case, okay, maybe he's a little bit more likely or lucky some of those get converted. But if the case has been consistent in the last four years of him simply not being able to convert them, at what point are we talking about it being a deficiency in his game versus just simply bad luck? It's not bad luck. It is a deficiency in his game. My reason for optimism is that he can score from far away because he has breakaway yeah. speed and breakaway Great. playability and the receiving upside uh, buoys him as well. But I recognize and totally understand that he will never probably be a top five or top six running back. Even if the Bears are this year's 2022 Eagles or whatever, he's still probably limited to a high-end RB2 because he's not going to punch in the amount of touchdowns that he needs to unless he runs super hot on big plays and just breaks off like seven 80-yard touchdowns or something like that. Um, but yeah, Swift is a guy that we disagree a little bit on. Let's get into Raheem Mostert, um, who's RB24, and then we got one more guy and we'll close this thing out. In the bull case for Raheem Mostert, it's, it's very similar to what we said earlier, where if you were to just, you know, I know a lot of casual players that will just sort by the previous year's points and just say, oh my God, how is this guy on the board? He was the a top five running back in points per game last year. He rushed in, you know, 18 rushing touchdowns in 2023. Raheem Mostert led the entire NFL in rushing touchdowns by three. Like he had 18, nobody else in the NFL had over 15. So with Raheem Mostert, Top five NFL running back uh, in terms of fantasy points per game last year. Still attached to an elite offense. Had full short yardage autonomy for the Dolphins last year. 19 inside the five carries. The next closest Dolphins running back last year in terms of inside the five carries had four. Devon Achan had four inside the five carries. Raheem Mostert was at 19. So I can understand why people will see what he did last year and say, you know what? If that role continues, he can smash again this upcoming year. But the problem I have and the bear case for Raheem Mostert is that he is the biggest injury risk in 2024 of the running backs we're talking about. You mentioned Aaron Jones earlier, but with Raheem Mostert, we're talking about a 32-year-old running back coming off the most touches of his career in the last two seasons who has missed significant time in the past in his career. If you guys actually look at the Draft Sharks Injury Guide, uh, a.k.a. Sports Injury Predictor, you guys do see that his chance of injury in 2024 88.8% of the time, he will miss at least two quarters this year. He has a 12.1% chance of injury per game. Uh, projected games missed 2.9. Uh, and his durability rating on a rating of 1 to 5, 1 being the worst, 5 being the best, he was at a 1.8. So let's just say you're not drafting Raheem Mostert with a safe projection of how healthy he will be this season. Not to mention, like I said with Jameer Gibbs earlier, Devon Achan does enter year two, is the peak year of a running back. And the team did draft this offseason in day two of the NFL draft. Jalen Wright of Tennessee, a guy that we both had as a top four running back in this class, a guy that does weigh 210 pounds. He can compete with Raheem Mostert both in terms of overall touches and potentially taking away some of that red zone autonomy we saw last year. Not to mention with Raheem Mostert, if he's not getting complete autonomy on the goal line, he is an absolute zero in the passing game. Just over two targets per game he commanded with the Miami Dolphins this year. 
the verdict, dead zone or bet zone. I mean, it's pretty clear if you're understanding the tone of this argument. But And if you had Raheem Moser last year, you may be mad because it's like, how is he a dead zone running back? Like, he was so productive. Like, why are you labeling him dead zone? But there was a big difference when you were drafting him last year versus this year. Last year, he had a rookie A-chan. Last year, there was no Jalen Wright. Last year, you were getting him in the double-digit rounds. This year, you're forking over a top six round pick with a worse projection for Raheem Moser. The risky, uh, the, the profile is just way too risky, in my opinion. Again, there's a legit chance he becomes an untradeable asset midseason. If he plays the first three weeks of the season, gets hurt, we're talking week six. Can you trade him on the open market, Raheem Moser, if he suffers any type of injury? Yeah, I mean, you also forgot one other thing that went right for him last year is that Jeff Wilson entered the Got year hurt. banged up. Yeah. And he was supposed to be a big part of the offense, too. So, yeah, it's. It's not good for Raheem Mostert. Again, take your lightning in the bottle that you got last year and sell him. Like that's, yeah. if you have like a keeper league or a dynasty league or whatever, and people think he's going to do exactly what he did last year, it's, I'm telling you right now, it's like not likely to happen because HN's projected to get a bigger workload. That's what we do with year one to two, uh, year two running backs. Jalen Wright, like you said, is going to probably eat in more to the workload. And Raheem Mostert is just like you saw the like lowest win rate running backs. Raheem Mostert was on that list twice because he got injured in those seasons. Like he he's just the type of dude that you want to be early on him. You do not want to be late on him. And that's where I, how I feel about Raheem Mostert at this point in time. It's like I'll mix him in if he's round eight, round nine. I think he's worthwhile at that point. But that is not where he's going to go in home leagues based on what he did last year. Round six even feels like a, a like a value for a lot of the way that most fantasy drafters are going to draft. Like they're going to see him on the board and be like, oh, he scored 18 touchdowns last year on the ground. He's going to be like a, my fourth round pick or my fifth round pick. Like I in really casual leagues, he's going to go higher than round six, in my opinion. Yeah, and this isn't exactly a fun fact, especially if your name is Raheem Mostert. Uh, this is more just a fact that in the last two years, he's played 31 NFL games in his. What is that? Uh, seven years prior. 25, 34, 45, 48. He's played 59 games in the seven years prior. Yeah, no, it's just like, how often is an, a top five running back season coming from a guy who's in his like ninth NFL season, who's done pretty much nothing to that point in his career? We knew he was talented, but he wasn't the type of dude that was going to do it for 17 games in a row. We just, you, you got lightning in a bottle. If you drafted him, and I hope you did, because he was literally in my top five sleepers video that I dropped yeah. on my birthday last year. He was such up. a great pick. It was, we were all over him last year. He was one of my favorite picks early portion of the season for zero RBs and stuff. And he caught lightning in the bottle and you were so happy you drafted him. It's just not going to happen again. And if his ADP was still in the 11th round, like it was last year, like I probably would be fine with taking him there, but how does his projection get worse with more backfield competition with HN going into year two and his ADP rises five rounds? It's because people are seeing 18 rushing touchdowns and thinking that, like you said, oh my God, I'm getting the RB5, 18 rushing touchdowns all the way here in the sixth round. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would take him in round eight, round nine. That's probably about yeah, the earliest. Round nine is where I'm at. For RB2, RB2 for a hero RB, he's the perfect type of dude for that, but he, he is going to go higher than that in home league. So quickly, we'll wrap up the RB25 and ADP, and that's Najee Harris. Bull case for him is Arthur Smith. Arthur Smith loves to run the ball, and he's actually very good at scheming up a rushing offense, and the Steelers added a shit ton of pieces on their offensive line. One of the probably most improved offensive lines in the NFL this year, especially as a run blocking unit, given the scheme change and given the offensive line additions like Troy Fatanu, like Mahler in the run game, the types of dudes they added, Zach Frazier, Troy Fatanu, they're going to be a lot better running the football. And Najee Harris is the primary in between the tackles runner. So he's going to be a big beneficiary of that. The other part of the bull case is that he's a big running back with touchdown upside. He's caught passes in years past. So he's probably going to contribute from that perspective. The bear case where I kind of stand on Najee Harris, and I actually would say of all the years of Najee Harris's career so far, this is the most I've been in on him in yeah. years past. He's a middling talent. We know this about Najee Harris. He's not even the best talent in his backfield. Jalen Warren is a better player than him. We all know this as well. So for me, he's a dead zone running back, but only for the reason that I prefer his teammate. If he was alone in this backfield, I'd actually feel quite good about Najee Harris. It's just that I would rather take Jalen Warren who goes after him. 
Yeah, I'm of the same belief. And funny enough, again, I hate to make everything about the Cowboys, but it does feel relatively similar to what we saw from the Zeke Pollard dynamic a few years ago, where Zeke, you know, the goal line back, the thick running back between the tackles, all the boomers love his thundering rushing style. But when you actually look at the advanced metrics, the nerds prefer the Pollard, prefer the warm because of just how damn efficient they are, just how good they are in the passing game as well. So for me personally, when I have to make that bet over the, you know, safe volume that Najee has shown in his, in his first couple of years versus the implied upside of Warren potentially taking more work. I'm making the bet on the Warren as well. I completely agree with you. Give me Jalen Warren over Najee Harris. Yeah, and again, Najee was actually good last year, like legitimately. Like he had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of his th- 11, sorry, of his last, what, 15, 16 games of the season. Got out to a slow start, but after that, he was like an RB2 or better in like 11 of 16 games. Like he was legitimately consistent. He was getting you production. He was actually producing on a per touch basis. He had eight touchdowns, caught 29 passes. Again, he's a fine pick outside of the running back dead zone in sharper leagues, but in the running back dead zone where people are maybe buying back into him and they might not be because this is a challenging price to gauge (laughs) with Arthur Smith. People don't like Arthur Smith. People don't like Najee Harris. So if he's going round five, round six, round seven, like he will go in a lot of really casual leagues. Do not draft Najee Harris there. But if he goes in round eight, round nine, you need some RB2 production. He's a fine pick at that point, but don't draft him over his teammate. Jalen Warren should absolutely be going ahead of him. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. Um, But either way, that completes the dead zone. So if you guys enjoyed this segment, we thought we would attack it in a fun way. Obviously, we make a dead zone video every year talking about the rounds three to seven range, kind of determining what the dead zone kind of looks like. We thought this year adding this wrinkle, talking about the dead zone versus the bet zone, seeing the success of the dead zone last year, added a fun wrinkle for you guys, almost like a game show feel where it's like, you're one or the other. Are you betting on the guy or are you just completely fading him? Yeah, so by my count, what? how many bet zone running backs did we have? So we said that uh, James Cook was a bet zone running back. I said Rashad White was as well, but not at his price tag. So technically Rashad White, James Cook, uh, Ramondre Stevenson, DeAndre Swift are bet zone running backs, at least at this point in time. But again, price dependent for like Aaron Jones and James Conner and some of the guys like that. So I would say, generally speaking, I mean, the hit rates, as we detailed last year, was 50%. But generally speaking, the hit rate is about 30 to 40%, which is about the range we're at bet zone to dead zone profiles. Yeah. And I mean, not to mention overall, we do see, for example, a lot of these guys have much more affordable ADPs over on underdog, for example, versus in your home leagues. The fact that we even got to 30, 40% as running back haters, despite knowing inherently that home league ADP will prop these guys up at least one to two rounds. At the end of the day, running backs have never been more affordable. You just have to know which ones to take. Yeah. And again, like these are averages that we're using as the ADPs. Like for example, Aaron Jones's ADP is 64.0 in the, in our average ADP, but his underdog ADP is 80 and his home league ESPN sleeper and Yahoo ADP combined are all in the top 60. So he's, he's balanced. He's propped up by his home league ADP, but in sharper leagues or an underdog, you can actually get him round seven, round eight, no problem where he's going off the board. So again, if you guys enjoyed this video, if you feel like you got some value from it, leave a like down below. This was a really long discussion. We do the classic thing. We said we were going to be 45 minutes. We definitely were not 45 yeah, minutes, but if you made longer. it all the way to the end and you did enjoy, hit the subscribe button. All of this data, like the um, multi-site ADP especially, is extremely, extremely valuable. That is in our draft guide along with our rankings, contextualized game logs, last year's point per game scoring, fantasy football news blurbs by team that I organize and update weekly. The risk ratings, I'm going to be adding a bunch more of those. We got super flex rankings coming soon, our draft ready cheat sheet coming soon. All of that is available in our draft guide. You can get that by going to the link in the description down below, signing up on underdog fantasy using 10 bucks and the promo code FSE. You'll get 250 in bonus cash on the site to use and a special pick them. And you'll get our draft guide for free. Or if you already have an underdog account and you can't play underdog where you live, you can head on over to flockfantasy.com and use the promo code FSE when you sign up over there for seven days for free, 30% off, and six months for free when you sign up annually. So check that out if you guys are interested. Both things will be linked down below in the description. But with that being said, peace out, and we'll talk to you soon.